welcome our next speaker, Dr. Barry Tan. He earned his doctorate in chemistry with emphasis on biochemistry at the Uni University of Otago, New Zealand. He later became a professor of chemistry and a food science and well, professor of chemistry and food, food science nutrition. His research, research expertise includes lipid soluble materials with focus today on lipid soluble nutrients that have an impact on chronic and degenerative conditions. He founded the American River Nutrition, uh, he founded the American River Nutrition Incorporated in 1998. Please give a welcome to Barry Tan. Good morning. <clears throat> I hope you're in the, in the right place where the talk will be on Toko Trienal this morning. I'm supposed to read the disclaimer, so I should do that. Um, I do have a financial interest in the product Toko Trienal, um, and I do not take grants or continuing dental or medical association education program. And my interest today is just to let you know about the signs of uh, vitamin E, particularly in the lesser known uh, toco trienol portion of the vitamin E and I don't know how other uh, uh, colleagues who give speeches do and I'm hoping to do this at 50,000 feet high to describe and telling stories of it and I'm very grateful that I am OMT invited me to come to speak and hopefully in the future I could speak on more direct uh, topics presented here today so this is more like a summary aspect of research that other people have done. Some of them we did ourselves, so, um, so let's see where this would take us. <clears throat> In the background, that's a, a natto plantation from South America, and on the right-hand side is a picture of the natto plant. We have this kind of plant frequently uh, for making color, like in Dorito chips or in uh, uh, che uh, cheese making. So. <clears throat> and I'm hoping to give this vitamin E talk in this aspect, some background of vitamin E, identifying some of the his historical aspect of tocopro leading to tocotrienol, <clears throat> and then the second part of it to describe the functions of tocotrienol as they are differentiated away fr from tocopro. And then in the last part, some emerging signs of tocotrienol and in deference to an audience that is largely dentist, and that I believe is also the reason why IAOMT invited me to come to speak. Otherwise, I would have no connection to the dentist except to see my dentist because I have some oral fix. And, and the last part is because Toko Trino has been shown to mitigate radiation. And this is a discovery of the United States government. Very interesting story by itself. So as we go on, we'll see how this would be developed at the progression of background understanding and then some signs of toco trieno as they're differentiated from tocopro and towards the end the emerging part and uh, highlighting the radiation portion and other aging aspects of it. <coughs> vitamin E uh, began in the US by these two uh, medical doctors, uh, Dr. Bishop and Dr. Evans from UC Berkeley and they first discovered this in 1922 because this unknown dietary factor have its essential capability in reproduction. And hence, sometimes vitamin E is referred to a birth vitamin. <clears throat> and through the passage of time, uh, this is a snapshot of at 50,000 feet high going through the past 100 years. On the top is tocopherol, uh, uh, 1922, as I indicated before. A short time after that, some 10 or so years, the isolated from wheat germ, an antioxidant property was elucidated, the structure was known, and soon after that they found out that palm, uh, no, sorry, soybean has huge amount of tocopherol, and then they extract. So most of the natural vitamin E, which is tocopherol, that you would get to take, will be extracted from uh, soybean. Uh, um, I have so many stories to tell, but this one here, I'll skip it if you have time. If you come to my booth, I'll explain to you some Korean scientists who are so fascinated by the toco trienal aspect of 
rather than tocopherol, they actually genetically manipulated the gene inside the soybean and make it convert to tocotrienol instead of the natural tocopherol. And in so doing, they were testing some hypothesis of the power of tocotrienol. So you have to ask me about that. But normally, if you take natural tocopherol, it will be from soybean. And then now if you look at the bottom from left to right, that would be tocotrienol. The discovery of tocotrienol is 40 years later. I'm, I'm, I'm explaining it like this because people oftentimes ask me, how come vitamin E is such a vitamin, you know? And how come we know about tocotrienol so late? Uh, why? There must be a reason, and, and this is what I'm hoping to tell you why. First, the discovery of tocotrienol is 40 years after. The discovery of tocotrienol from the USDA, as well as University of uh, Bristol in England. And then the production of uh, tocotrienol vitamin E first in commerce is not so long ago compared to this, see, almost 50 years after. And then from rice, also tocotrienol, and then from anato, which is what I'm hoping to speak in uh, this conference here. And as well, besides the fact that it was discovered 400 years, uh, 40 years later, the Merck index, which is what chemists use to look to see the chemical inside, they did not change the misnomer of tocopherol until 2001. In other words, if you think of tocopherol, you have alpha, beta, delta, gamma tocopherol, you see? And the tocotrienol also alpha, beta, delta, gamma tocotrienol. But if you read in some of the literature in the 1970s and 80s, and even uh, in the early 90s, and then they stopped doing it, you actually find other Greek letters to tocopherol. It knew epsilon, and zeta. You'll find zeta tocopherol, nu tocopherol, and epsilon tocopherol. These tocopherol are actually tocotrienol. They, they, they are mislabeled, they're misnomer. So the Merck Index decided to correct them only as recent as uh, 12 years ago. So you see, all this is happening in the literature. So for us who want to know what the functions are, it will most certainly be a Johnny come lately, you know. But, so, but at least better late than never. <coughs> Somewhere here, I didn't have enough time, from the University of Wisconsin in 1982 here, uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Karashi, who is still uh, living and doing research work, he, first, he is the first to discover the function of tocotrienol differentiated from tocopherol. He did that by showing, he extracted from barley, which only have a tiny amount, why barley? Because the USDA lab in University of Wisconsin was uh, concentrating on barley, not a very important crop in the US. Nonetheless, he did it there, and he extracted the tocotrienol and he fed it to hypercholesterolemic pygmy pigs. And when they did that, they can see the massive drop in the cholesterol. That's caused them to have derived interest in how does this particular vitamin E lower cholesterol. And that was the beginning of the differentiation of function from this class of vitamin E to the popularly known one, tocopherol. <clears throat> Many of us have read in the literature in the last five years or so, tocopherol function in large study is a blah. At the very best, best it did not function to lower anything on cardiovascular diseases or cancer. And at worst, some of them indicate that it would even increase prostate cancer. If you don't believe me, you just Google and you can read it. And that's referring to synthetic alpha tocopherol. So I emphasize the word synthetic. It has particular meaning. I don't have time to explain here. It, it makes other compounds besides just alpha tocopherol. And the synthetic, besides the synthetic, is only alpha tocopherol, not even the other portions of tocopherol. Now, and others in Vanderbilt University said that for antioxidant suppression, they're as high as 2.1 gram, a whopping amount, to see any function on the protection. However, on tocotrienol, the two recent books published in here, more than one-third of all the research in the last 30 years were published in the last three years. So in one sense, sense that the little we know about uh, a tocotrienol is also because only in the last couple of years, massive amount of study uh, have, been, have come out, and I'm hoping to review some of these studies. And you can pick up copies of this book out there. So then, in big picture again, vitamin E family, 
you have four tocopherols here, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. It began with alpha from the two people that discovered in 1922, and since then they have been able to find these other components, and it seemed like gamma, delta and gamma tocopherol are more active than alpha tocopherol. The same is also true on the tocotrienol that came later. If I were to give you the end at the beginning, like what Johnny Carson used to do, you know, he give the answer before the question, so I'll do that. I would say that almost all the study on vitamin E emphasize delta tocotrienol and gamma tocotrienol, what I refer to it as desmethyl tocotrienol, these two here. A few study is on alpha tocotrienol, mostly these two. I'm hoping to give you a summary of some of these study. Occasionally, I'll give you a specific study because of the brevity of time, and I'll be glad. I, I usually reference the study, and, and I have some published work out there. You can get copies of it. I publish in Townsend letter, and then if you email me, I can send you the complete study, or you can go to PubMed to look for them too. It is pretty compelling. Remember, at the end of the day, this is still a vitamin. So it's, it's really as good as it's going to get. <clears throat> Structurally, uh, a vitamin E look like this. It's got a head and then a tail, a head and then a tail. A tocopherol has a bigger head. A tocotrienol have a smaller head. The pictorial here, the cartoon here is that the tail is cringed up because in a tocotrienol it has three double bonds, so it's just cringed up, shorter tail. Tocopherol is saturated tail, so it's longer. Dr. Uh, Packer from UC Berkeley in 1970s did a study. He found out that tocotrienol is about 50 times more potent than the than the tocopherol, I mean, capturing free radical. If you use stoichiometry, you, you cannot explain that. You know, it's just too big a difference. So he had to rationalize why that was. And he devised a study, it's a pretty elegant study. If you think of a cell, the cell membrane, it almost looked like a bean shape, you know? And then the tocopherol molecule, the anchors into the biomembrane, and the head is sticking up. And the head is the antioxidant thing. And the, this is just anchoring into it. And he noticed that using electron spin resonance, the tocopherol is spinning around the whole cell or the biomembrane slower. And the tocotron is spinning 50 times faster. So he theorized that the capability of the tocotron to capture the free radical that both of them have on the head here is similar, except the tocotron can spin 50 times faster. So in short, I like to use this as an analogy. The tocopherol would be like a policeman staying in the confine of a town. And then the tocotrino would be a state trooper who's able to cross the entire state. Both, cat, both catch the bad guys, and tocotrino can do it faster. That's it. That's just my little acronym on it. And then on, on the size thing, you can see the molecular weight of a tocopherol. All of them are above 400. And delta tocotrino is the only one less than 400 signifying the smallest of the size of the molecule, enabling it. Of all the molecules made in nature that, that are antioxidant in the lipid profile, I don't have time to speak about the water-soluble antioxidant, the lipid-soluble antioxidant that facilitate the human body in how it can work. I cannot think of any molecule better suited for, to fit into the phospholipid and inside the phospholipid, then two compounds. This is speaking as a chemist now. It would be a vitamin E molecule and a coenzyme Q10. I cannot think of any other molecule can fit like that. I can think and theorize that azazanthin out there, and then you, all of us can read about that. Nothing I read that you cannot read, but I cannot think of two molecules better fitted into a phospholipid than coenzyme Q10 which is very lipid soluble because it's twice the molecular weight of vitamin E, then a tocopherol and a tocotrienol molecule. With the only exception that tocotrienol can spin around much faster and able to do the job better. I hope this is really hope, uh, useful to you because my intention is to pass information and then you can make use as you wish. This is the rub on the road. When we did uh, some of these studies, we found out that if you have huge amount of alpha tocopherol, it interferes, it, it breaks, it mitigates the function of tocotrienol. 
and many people have challenged me on this study. We, we systematically documented this study, and I wrote a chapter on this in the book. I theorized this like that. Of all the eight vitamin E molecules, alpha tocopherol is the only one that have a transport protein. Alpha tocopherol transport protein. Now that's a long phrase. What does that mean? It just have a chaperone to go from A to B. It has the right of passage. All the other vitamin E and many of the food that we eat, they do not have rites of passage. They just have passive diffusion, emulsification, blah, 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 and you just get absorbed with bio salt, you know, stuff that we know, you know. But when you have a transport protein like that, they have rites of passage. And they are not fake, they're real. Well, think of it. If you take vitamin A retinol, it specifically show up on the back of your retina. You think it just can go to your retina? I don't think so. And if you take copious amount of calcium, and we presume they automatically will go to the bone, that would be just naive. You know, they have their transporting capability to bring it there, and vitamin D is one of them. So now I'm, I'm digressing, I shouldn't do that. No, but, 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 but for, for, to, for tocotri, you know, it goes to passive diffusion. So if you take a copious amount of alpha tocopherol, it would definitively mitigate the function of tocotri. You know, it's been shown for all of these things here. Now on composition, there are only three sources of tocotrienol that are found in nature. I've been working with vitamin E for the last 30 years. I hope I communicate to you, not as a pride, but you know, this is a labor of love for the long haul. And these three sources from palm and rice and anato, they were all discovered by me and make it into common. So some of them I'm happy with, some of them I'm less happy with. And I'm still looking for new sources for this kind of material. When you see this, you see rice and palm have 25 to 50 percent tocopherol. Remember what we said in the last slide. And anato is the only one that is tocopherol free. Furthermore, the two most active one is delta and gamma tocotrienol. The anato only contain these two. It's almost unbelievable that a plant has it, just these two. And then for palm, it has about 50% of the delta and gamma, and the rice have 35%. So two things in, in point. They are tocopherol in rice and palm, 30, 25 to 50%, and the anato is tocopherol free. And the two most active tocotrina is only found in anato. And I decided to put a chart of the anato HPLC here. You see, the gamma tocotrienol, 10%, and the delta tocotrienol, 90%. You know, any of you who are familiar with a medicine man, looking for an active ingredient from a plant, you will appreciate this. If you have an active ingredient that is even 1%, 5%, 10%, that's a home run. But if you have an ingredient when it's 100%, the two active components, I, I cannot think of it any other way. This is as good as you're ever going to get from nature. I'm hoping, how much time do I have, may I ask? What time is it now? Okay, I'll tell this story. I, I, I love this story. You know, if you go to my book, there's a picture of the anato plant. All of us eat fruit. <clears throat> when, you think that, when you ask the question, what fruit do you like? You usually think of the texture, the succulency, the acidity, and the sweetness. Wouldn't be that true? And uh, almost all fruit have that. This particular anato has no flesh. It does not have a miso carb. It just, if you open it, it's as if that the flesh is air, and then you have a stem sticking out, and the seeds are around. Now, I have beautiful pictures out there. About 15, 12, 15 years ago, I went to South America. By this time, I have already spent 15, 20 years of my life working on vitamin E. I got tired, you know. I need to take a break. So I just, uh, I, I, you know, it's good. I need to take a break. So I went back to my first love. My first love is carotenoid. I started with beta carotene. I love lutein, zeaxanthin, azaxanthin, all this wonderful thing that you heard about, the colors of life. And then Johanna Seden at Harvard Medical School, she found out that in the back of the retina, you have differentiating amount of lutein and zeaxanthin to help people with macular degeneration. I said, wow, 
this is in the 1990s, you know. I was already in it at that time. And then I was told that if you go to South America, there's a giant marigold plow about yay big, and, and you can extract it from the petals, because I'm also a little bit of a medicine man. And I wanted to go to South America. I want to get the petal. I want to get my lutein and zeaxanthin, and this would help many people with macular degeneration. So you see? And I went uh, to Ecuador. Now that itself is also a funny situation. You know, I'm Asian and Chinese. There are lots of herbs like that in Asia, you know. But I went to South America, cannot speak a word of Spanish, you know. But I got to look for this plant, right? Never mind any ethnicity, anything. It was nothing like this, you know. So I can't tell story like what I would like to, but this is what it is. And I went there. I did find a giant marigold. So I could get to my access to my lutein and zeaxanthin. and I was very happy. But fate has it. Exactly 30 feet away from me, I saw the anato plant. I just saw the plant. I was stunned by the beauty of the plant. Nothing of Toko Trino came to my mind. So when the pot opens, I only saw the seed. And if I smear it, and you can see it's red. The British claim that they discovered it. It's actually a Spanish gentleman 20 years, 200 years before. But the British nicknamed it the lipstick plant, probably the origin of the why the women lipstick was red color, you know? They, they label, you give a type lipstick plant, you see the thing. There are many, many nicknames. Well, I saw this, and I knew the color was a carotenoid. And carotenes are incredibly unstable, much more unstable than omega-3, I can assure you, because they're conjugated double bond. And now this plant is phototropic, photo following the sun like a sunflower. So it's not only oxidation, it's photooxidation. So I surmise, and this is one of the surmise that lead to a finding. Most of my surmise, I might submit to you, they reach a cul-de-sac and it's dead-ended. So I'm not very proud of myself, but this is the one that did not get dead-ended. You know, I surmise that there must be a very powerful antioxidant that this plant has made, and evolutionarily they do not want to make a flash and make sugar and attract it to procreate the seeds, stuff like that, and then decided to and they make a floral note so they deceive the birds of the air thinking that the seed would be a food but something must protect the color to make it look like a food, you follow? So the, so the carotene must be protected. I thought it was a polyphenol, you know? And there are very powerful polyphenol around. I took it in the lab. I was shocked that it is a vitamin E. Further shocked that it only contained tocotrienol. And most shocked, it only contained delta and gamma tocotrienol. That, for me, is, it, it was my happiest moment as a scientist. <laughs> that was a story. <laughs> now, back to some science. I hope IAOMT will not ostracize me for this. And, and, uh, uh, in, the last, in the first 50 years, most of the research was done on tocopherol. In the last 30 years, most of it was done on tocotrienol, mostly on chronic conditions like cancer, cardiovascular disease. The antioxidant work is still there, but dropped. It seemed to be coming back. And then there's emerging in other area. And it, one of the main emerging in other area for this audience is radiation protection. So I hope to cover them all. And as an antioxidant, a German study, you see they tried all the tocopherols and all the to tocotrienol, delta and gamma tocotrienol, have the highest oxygen radical capturing capacity, the lipid one, not a surprise. This is done uh, in, a, in vitro outside in a test tube. Then in cardiovascular benefits, they tried on carotid artery here on arteriosclerosis, and then they did it in an animal study. One is done in Uni University of North Carolina, the other one is done in University of Wisconsin. When they did alpha tocopherol and low fat, high fat, high fat longer time, alpha tocopherol worked marginally. If there's 70% as the delta and gamma tocotrienol, much better. If it's just the delta and gamma tocotrienol, it works the best, regardless of whether it's low fat, high fat, or high fat for the longest time. And this is the longest clinical study on carotid arteriosclerosis done in New York uh, about 10 years ago, where they followed people over four years on those on placebo against tocotrienol. It would have been enough. If they add tocotrienol, and then it would slowly retard them from having progressively getting worse, that would have been enough. 
but when they gave toco you know, to the patient, some of them regress. In other words, improve, sorry. They improve, and the arterial function on the carotid artery improved over the four years. And beyond four years, they decided that there are no more additional study needed to be done here, so the study stopped. On the cholesterol reduction study, this is a composite study of several of them. When the alpha tocopherol is higher, they have to use much higher amount and longer periods of time, and some of them did not even drop. In one of them, after four years, it, the cholesterol dropped. When the alpha tocopherol is much lower in the mixture, you can see the LDL begin to drop, even the triglyceride. And when the alpha tocopherol is zero, meaning only tocotrienol, the amount is not high, about 100 milligrams, which is really a small amount compared to vitamin E the normal people take. You can see the triglyceride and the LDL drop approximately 15 and 20 percent, some patients even higher. In the 1980s, Bristol Myers Squibb that have the statin drug protocol, they were very interested to commit this tocotrienol to be a pharmaceutical drug. And they did this in conjunction with University of Wisconsin. So they make pure gamma tocotrienol, pure delta tocotrienol. You see, when they use pure, the, the cholesterol drop, either delta or gamma. And the HDL, which is a good cholesterol, increase. Now let me jump. Cardiovascular disease and diabetes, they could be overlapping. But diabetes have their own demon, you know. And the American Heart Association said that three of these five risk factors, you can see when there are three risk factors, the relative risk already increased, the green three feature. When they get to four or five, the risk is really high. And of course, southeastern part of the United States is not a good sign. And uh, oh, look, the word obesity get trapped here. I don't know how it get. Well, anyhow, in the, in the last 30 years, you can see that the percent of obesity have increased. Most of this information we heard in the radio and the news so frequent, it's not news anymore. Nevertheless, on the top of the risk factor to be dropped for di diabetic will be triglyceride. It's very interesting. If you have cardiovascular disease, you want the cholesterol to drop. But if you have diabetes, you want to control the triglyceride. You notice that? Lowering LDL is not one of the risk factors for diabetes. Not that it is good, it's just not a risk factor. And this is my take of it. What I wanted to go after non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This term is clumsy, and we heard about this. You know, it's only identified as early as 1980 in Mayo Clinic. This is a non a fatty al a liver is unrelated to, to, to alcohol drinking. And the global prevalence is high. Of the 30 million in US with NAFLD, 20 million of them are diabetic. And people who have this condition have these things here. And people who are diabetic have four in five fatty pancreas, more than four in five. My take of this is that if you have fat stored here, subcutaneous fat, that's considered OK. That's my thing. If it's omentum, which is below the subcutaneous, not so OK. But if your fat is stored in the muscle, in the pancreas, in the liver, that are, those are the most dangerous part. And those parts, and right now, more and more connection between people who are overweight, obese, or diabetic, or metabolic syndrome, they cross over, and they begin to have very fatty uh, tissues of the three that I mentioned here. And this is an example. First, this is done in animal study, where they, ha they add tocotrienol, and the fatty depot in the liver disappear. And in one clinical study, more need to be done on this. This was a preliminary study. However, the preliminary studies show uh, very promising improvement people on tocotrienol for fatty liver. And on, in the blood, the triglyceride dropped 28%. And interestingly enough, this group used half delta tocotrienol, half gamma tocotrienol. Not a signature of anything. They use these two because these two are the most active ones in their composition. And then the triglyceride drop in delta and gamma tocotrienol. As all of us know, cholesterol thing and triglyceride is only one side. The flip side of this is inflammation. And uh, studies have been done. This is done in, I've forgotten the university that did this, that when they use delta tocotrienol, it's the one that reduces the greatest inflammation with in 
interleukin-6, nitric oxide, COX-2, PGE-2, you see, the delta tocotrienol. And then they make this bottom statement here in the conclusion. This is done in University of Missouri Medical School. Interesting, I thought, that when they give to animal the tocotrienol, is able to raise the body increase of its own hormone to increase steroid production to inhibit the inflammation. So it's a, it's a, a defense against inflammation. Directly also the tocotrienol inhibit the protein and other signaling uh, protein such as this here directly. And when they did this with different molecules, delta and gamma shore up the best, as I indicated on this chart here. So I'm going to leave that into cancer like that. These are the five most common cancers. There are more cancers, but I already crop it off here. The delta and gamma tocotrienol has unambiguous role. Probably the cancer is the most spectacular of, of them all. And this is a study done on breast cancer, uh, estrogen responsive. They gave the patient 200 milligram, but it was a mixture at the time. Still better than not testing it. They give tamoxifen, tamoxifen and tocotrienol, and are not fantastic, but still something, that the five-year survival rate is one in 30 improvement from the one just with tamoxifen. They are repeating this study now, and only uh, to d eliminate the tocopherol, only tocotrienol, and they're going to increase the amount of milligram. So probably the odds of survival will be much higher than this. And these are all the composite of animal study done. You can just take a look yourself. This published in the last three to five years. Pretty dramatic. These are not studies that we fund. These are people out there doing their own study of their own merit in breast cancer. And prostate cancer, if you look at the bottom here, pretty much delta and gamma tocotrienol shore up the best. Interestingly enough, this particular group combined delta and gamma together, and when they did, it's synergistic. You see, it, just remember what anatotocotrienol is, you know. And then this is a study on pancreatic cancer. Look at what the, this is done in University of Southern Florida. They've gone on to phase one clinical trial, and it, they are designing phase two clinical trial only using delta tocotrienol. And all of us know pancreatic cancer, right? Unlike, nobody wants to have cancer. But unlike breast cancer and prostate cancer, the odd is not uh, one in seven or eight survive. The odds of pancreatic cancer is one in 20 survive, you see? So it is the most lethal of all cancer. And can you imagine that? They're using a simple vitamin E to go after this. And the only drug out there is gemcentabine. They're using pure delta tocotrienol. The NIH is funding this study. They're trying to make a drug out of this. I'm not going down that direction, but they are. You know, you can't stop people from doing They're going to do what they're going to do. And this is very promising. And this is their conclusion of what they want to do. The result, the picture is not, okay, the picture is here. This is the result. Rather than me saying, you can just read. It is very encouraging. This is going to show up in the next couple of months. They already published a number of animal studies. So to me, this is quite endearing. And I provided the initial tocotrienol to them to do the study. And so they did all the tocopherol and all the tocotrienol. They came up with the delta tocotrienol, not me. It, it, you know, only one of those papers, they said that they got the material from me. That's it. That's the only mention. All right. In the last bit here, some other emerging area, and I'm hoping to give some attention to this more than other. I don't know why angiogenesis is put here. It should be put in the cancer thing. Angiogenesis is a growth of new blood vessels. Most of us know this category because of cancer, but angiogenesis is also known in other areas like diabetic retinopathy, uh, uh, macular ed edema, inflammation, and some other parts like that, psoriasis. But cancer is a bigger spot for this kind of thing. And Toko trying to work on this. It, it knock off the VGF here, vascular endothelial growth factor, and also stop metastasis and inflammation, and also fouled up the already aberrant blood vessel here. Why does the cancer cause angiogenesis? Because they need a lot of nutrient, more than normal cell, so they have to hijack nutrient from the nearby artery. So it's a very simple concept. I met the professor who first came up with this concept, and he was ridiculed. How can cancer be so simplistic? But now, he's not ridiculed anymore. You know, angiogenesis is a real factor in this uh, sort of beyond the cancer forming. Then they start to grow on. 
This is a study done by a Japanese professor, Professor Miyazawa. I was thrilled to death. I was hoping and praying somebody would do this study, and he did. He showed that toco trieno, he tried all of the toco trieno, and he showed the delta toco trieno worked the best, that it actually knocked off angiogenesis. You look at the, sec the middle one with the delta toco trieno, the size of the tumor is smaller, and it looked emaciated because the blood vessel is, is, and cannot, be, cannot be borne up in that area where toco trieno is met. This is really exciting to me. Now, on the radiation part. And many of us know about the unfortunate situation in Japan. It took me a long time to put this together. It happened two and a half years ago. Uh, nature didn't help because of the, of the earthquake and then the tsunami. And if some of us remember, six months after that, Hurricane Roque came up from the southeast and blow up. That's why you see the plume line there, you see? And initially, the Japanese government said that it's safe within the first 12 miles, not safe further, not safe further, and not safe even further. So now the thing has gotten wider and wider. And of course, we picked up radiation even in organic cow's milk in California, you know, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm sure you can read that. But <clears throat> so there's always, we are in desperate need of energy. And nuclear energy is the cheapest, so you see, I. You know, I'm not here to say no, this and that, but I don't know how to solve the question. You know, all of us have energy. If I don't have energy, I can't be speaking. You can't hear me. You know, stuff like I, 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 we are in terrible shape. We're just in desperate need of energy, and it's a cheaper source of energy. You know, and now in the last, this is what happening in the last ten days, last ten days, my friend that Japan races to contain the worst Fukushima spill since meltdown. New radiation hotspot found in Fukushima. Operators struggle to control highly reactive water, suffer new setback, record radiation reading near Fukushima contaminated water. This is the beginning of this week. So today, two and a half years later, it is, radiation is still at a dangerous level, and the situation remains perilous. Now, just in case that we think that Japan is not doing enough, the next chart will give you some chill, you know? I spent half a year to plot this graph. In the U.S., we have 104 plants. 30 percent, almost one-third of them are as old as the one in Japan. And some of them are on earthquake-prone zone in California and in South Carolina, like that. And, and about one-third of the U.S. population live 50 miles from a nuclear reactor. That's more than 100 million people. And more, of course, 90% of them are on the eastern side of the United States. I'm from Massachusetts. I'm here. I'm stuck, man. <laughs> so n now, you know, um, Radiation comes in many forms. If I were to be a dentist, I care about the radiation on me and my patient. If I were to be a medical doctor, I have to go much higher radiation dose for radiation oncology. It, you know, that's also important. And there's lots and lots of CAT scan. You, you see them published recently that children have CAT scan now, have a 20 years later have new cancer like this. So, and you can see uh, we are very sensitive to that, particularly uh, the bone marrow. Now comes AFRI. How the United States government got into this? Here, Armed Forces Radiation and Radiobiology Institute. And this is part of the Uniform Services University in Bethesda, Maryland. This is not the place where the U.S. government trains soldiers. This is the university where the U.S. government trained people with masters and Ph.D. degree. They can, these are the places that the civilian university cannot do this study, such as Ebola virus. You cannot do Ebola virus in the North, no matter how clever that university is. And radiation, you zap it, and it's very dangerous, so it has to be done here. So they did this, and about eight years ago, it was classified at the time. I didn't know. Somebody in Tennessee bought some toco trienol from me. 
I don't know what the one is called. And then and they paid it, but I got curious. So I said, hey, can you just tell me what you're using your Toco Trino for? I said, hey, I pay for you, man. Don't ask any questions. I said, oh, gee, you know, you know, don't get that excited. I'm just, yay, yeah, man, I'm just trying to find out, you know, you know, because cause I know who the people who use Toco Trino, it would be for cardiovascular disease or diabetes, that, and somehow this guy. But when he cooled down, he said, I'll tell you this. It's something to do with the Department of Defense. And then jokingly, I said, oh, you mean it could be used as an incendiary device or something? You know. And he, he didn't think it was very funny. I, I didn't know what the heck it was, you know, because it doesn't have any flashpoint, nothing. So why would he use Toko Trinity? But actually, at the time, if you remember, I'm not making a political statement, just a historical statement. At the time, the then President Bush thought that we had uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We were already doing uh, many research like that. If we deliberately put our U.S. soldiers in harm's way, what do you give to them to protect them? You follow? Their question is the highest order, not like the kind of question you and I wanted. So they were doing all kinds of study, the hundreds of different compounds. And you know, they tried all the vitamin E, only two vitamin E work to protect them from radiation damage. It's delta tocotrine and gamma tocotrine. I know nothing about it. They only bought my anato tocotrine, purified and make the delta and gamma. They did the work. Anyway, three years ago, it got declassified. So they published all of this. So I read all about it, and so I'm giving you the answers now. They, they, gave, they have full body radiation. This is not x-ray, by the way, gamma radiation, intended to kill. You see, it's a warfare thing. They did that. What they wa want to see is how fast the bone marrow recover. If the bone marrow doesn't recover, it's not sustainable life as it is. You can see from here, white blood cell, neutrophil, platelet, and lymphocyte. They want it to recover in 28 days. And for the ones that are vehicle, you can see none of them recover, the blue line. And then with the one that use Delta Tocotrina, most of them recover into the yellow section here within two weeks or less. The yellow section is a normal animal. They, they, that is a normal range. So within two weeks, they're able to recover. That, I feel, is dramatic for, for a compound that is just a vitamin E, able to have that kind of severe damage to the body to able to recover on the blood thing. And this is the lethality side. They have it on the same 28 days on the survival. For the one that is a vehicle, almost 80% died after two weeks. On the one that is on Delta Toco Tri, you know, all of them survived. I would never have believed it if they didn't do this. And these studies are all published. If it's gamma tocotrienol, about 85% of them survive. And the other vitamin E doesn't come close. And anyway, I, I have taken over my time already. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about how it protects the neuron. I, I'm done with that. We are conducting study on protection, um, not on sublethal dose, or even lower than sublethal dose. Uh, on the radiation thing, so that it would be exposure similar to that that a medical doctor give to a patient or a dentist give to a, 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 a patient. So, but other studies had also been shown on uh, neuron health here, and this is another Japanese study. Put, very difficult to do neuron study where normal neuron is here, and then a stressed neuron. You can see it cringed up and here got all tangled. When they gave them gamma tocotrienol, the amount of here looks similar than here on the dendrite, and the axon begin to look more like here than here. So that, to me, is a good sign. So we have to design how to do the study to help people who have a degenerative disorder of the nerve. And this is the largest study in EU. They found out that vitamin E, especially toco tocotrienol drop, is associated with mild cognitive impairment and very connected to Alzheimer's disease, and that they found spent much higher level of spent and oxidized vitamin E associated with this disorder. This was an EU study, very large study. And then my colleague in Japan decided to study longevity in worms, and they found out that tocotan able to expand the lifespan of C. elegans. They have all sorts of different things, telomerase and a bunch of other studies. I just gave you the shorthand version, uh, and I can give you the papers that he published on this. And he also saw interference with alpha tocopherol. And then when he did it, and he saw this kind of thing too. Bone study. We're hoping to do osteopenia study, uh, one conducting in Texas and the one uh, in Malaysia to see and not already women with osteoporosis, osteopenia, which means 10 years or less after menopause. And then 
already in animal study, they show this kind of uh, repair and improvement to the bone. We are very excited about this as well. And summary, rather than me reading it, pretty much I'm hoping that if I did communicate to you in the last hour this, I'll be, I'm happy that your hour is, not, is well spent and not wasted. And it, this is good to put a face to a person. So I'm, on, I'm literally on my last two slides. Uh, that's Dr. Paul Song. He's recently joined us as he's a radiation oncologist and Sita Sinai joined us as a chief medical officer. And uh, this is a professor on metabolic syndrome in University of Queensland. And that's Professor Miyazawa that did the angiogenesis study that I show you. I believe Dr. Tanisawa is the only attending uh, dentist uh, in that symposium. And that is the person who did the breast cancer study. And that's Professor Malafa who did the pancreatic cancer and that's a gentleman in the United States government doing the uh, radiation on uh, radiation protection study and you can get any of this literature out of the booth there thank you very much thank you Dr. Tan